The Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Chris Ellis from Feathercoin. Hello. Megan Lords from Bitcoin, not bombs. Thanks for having me. Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Howdy, y'all. And the Bitcoin Group is live on WorldCryptoNetwork.com, TheBitcoinGroup.com, MadBitcoins.com, and now FollowTheCoin.com. So however you found us, thank you for watching. Issue 1, eBay, eBay, PayPal, Bitcoin. One step closer to total Bitcoin adoption eBay CEO John Donahue said recently to CNBC that there's no doubt that digital currency is going to play an important role going forward. And at PayPal, we're going to have to integrate digital currencies into our wallet. I know we talk about this all the time, but it looks pretty definite now. How soon will we be using PayPal as our digital wallet for cryptocurrencies and buying things on eBay with Bitcoin? Chris Ellis. I don't know how long, but this story keeps coming up because I think what the market wants is a signal of confidence. They want a big company like eBay, PayPal to send a signal to other companies like Amazon that this is okay to make it safe for them to do. So, yeah, we've kind of heard a lot from this, but I'll see it when I believe it. Megan Lords. I don't know that I have a time span on this either, but I think digital currencies have you know, been in the process of being adopted for a long time, whether or not that's Bitcoin, uh, we'll see. Obviously, Bitcoin is the most popular, but I think a lot of people have been moving in this general direction towards digital currencies, and these companies are going to have to adopt them if they want to keep up. That's just the direction things are heading. Uh, people don't like carrying cash around. It's it's become inconvenient to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, the market's provided that opportunity. So I, th I think it's very exciting. I, I hope they jump on board quickly. Um, but like, like Chris said, I, I think at this point it's very much a, a matter of signaling and who's going to be the first uh, major um, person to the market to kind of help others, uh, help encourage others uh, to adopt it. So we'll see. I, I'm very excited. Christoph Atlas. Um, I think that there's there's a, a bit of a, a funky timing here with, with PayPal and Bitcoin. So uh, in the long run, I don't see people keeping their Bitcoins in institutions like PayPal. Um, I think that cryptocurrency is going to bring a new... Uh, realm of finance in which people are the custodians of their own wealth and I know that we don't really have the hardware technology to really uh, match that need at the moment but I think it's coming and so there's going to be a bit of a tricky timing for uh, players like PayPal where it will be to their benefit to act as the custodian for funds and certainly that's what people will be comfortable with at first but in the long run I don't think that that's what people will uh, choose to do. It does seem like with each announcement, eBay moves closer to this. You really think that they're kind of stalling and buying time for their programmers as they frantically work to develop this website that he keeps talking about that obviously he wants. Uh, you might think eBay would just buy Coinbase or another similar operator like that just to get instantly into this game that they clearly want to be involved in. They keep talking about it. Perhaps they're trying to scare off competitors by talking about it, but I'd imagine what Chris is saying is correct, is this is signaling. And the fact that eBay is signaling so heavily in this direction means that other companies are going to hear it and they're going to be prepared. And if they can't beat eBay to market, they might come out just a few months after eBay. It's going to seem like how they do it so fast, but the real answer is they started working on it now. Exit question. Which one of eBay's competitors will be the first to join them in Bitcoin? Will anyone beat them to it? Chris J. Well, their competitors are just starting now, and they're all the little startups that are coming out with the gift cards and things like that. I actually see um, software like Dark Wallet being a, a genuine competitor, actually, and, and those kind of browser plugins you get that make it really easy um, to be able to pay, pay people when you're straight into the browser in context without having to switch to a wallet. It is true it would be difficult to, for PayPal to offer anonymous transactions. That would be a clear advantage that Dark Wallet or Dark Coin could have. Mega yeah. lords. And I think when it comes to anonymity, uh, your average person may not care so much about that. 
you know, they're they're just looking for an alternative to use a, a newer payment system to use or alternative currency to use. So uh, as far as eBay's competitors, I don't know that they have a whole lot of competitors, and I think it would be wise of eBay to go ahead and jump on the bandwagon. I mean, before their competitors, I don't know uh, how how much. Uh, adopting Bitcoin would really benefit their competitors. The the main competitor I see is is of course Amazon.com. If you're going to sell a used item like a book or a DVD, you might choose between eBay and Amazon. If you're going to buy a used item, you might be choosing between the two. And if one of them accepted Bitcoin, that might make a huge difference over which one you're going to purchase with. So. Will Pangman, what about eBay, Bitcoin, and PayPal? Yeah, it's really exciting. You know. Um, this time last year, you saw a different tone from a lot of these executives at these businesses getting asked about Bitcoin. So I, I saw earlier CNBC uh, kind of took a totally different tone about Bitcoin, a very kind of bullish tone in, in a recent article about you know the venture capital opportunities in Bitcoin and um, the you know the 2.0 innovations and things. So um, yeah, it's very exciting. I'm really glad everything's coming around. It is no you know nowhere to go but up and. Uh, the rest of the world is catching on, so that's exciting. Uh, competitors, I like Chris's answer. I think Open Bazaar is uh, the best candidate, um, other than say Amazon, um, which has a slightly different, you know, uh, target market. But there is crossover, as you pointed out. I I'm excited to see decentralized marketplaces come out. The CNBC article is very exciting. We always had the smart people with us, but now we're going to have the smart money as well. Christoph Atlas. I think that um, Open Bazaar is probably not an immediate challenger to eBay, but it's the type of marketplace that I'm the most interested in. What motivates me in the realm of Bitcoin is not simply that we will gradually overtake other currencies to, um, you know, in, in existing businesses, but that we will forge new types of uh, uh, commerce and new economies and new ways of inter interacting with each other, economically speaking. And I think Open Bazaar is sort of the uh, the spearhead of that effort right now. But it does have a way to go. It would take quite a bit of uh, funding and programmer time and so forth to perfect what Open Bazaar is trying to do in order to uh, give it a much broader appeal. Uh, but still, it has by far the most promise uh, over something like eBay. Excellent. Moving on. Issue 2. CoinJar returns to the App Store. Apple's new iTunes Store rules allow for Bitcoin apps, as demonstrated by the UK and Australian-based CoinJar, which returned to the UK and Australian App Stores. US? No luck yet. Will the other apps return as well? Is Apple's long, dark, Bitcoinless nightmare over? Megan Lords. So I think Apple has a pretty good reputation for listening to their customers, and obviously when they ban the Bitcoin uh, wallet server, there's a huge outrage over it. And I, I hope they've learned their lesson over that, even though Bitcoin users make up a very small uh, group of just overall iPhone users. I think they raised enough of a ruckus to make an impact on Apple, and I really hope that this is a matter of them listening to their customers and really trying to um, adapt and uh, bring in these new apps because in the long run it's going to benefit them. Uh, I think they lost a few people to Android and uh, and if they would have continued with the kind of mindset they were going with then that would just keep happening over time. So I, I think this is a huge step in the right direction and I hope, I hope all the apps come back. That would be great. Will Pangman. Um, yeah, so I, I see an interesting trend with this. Yeah, I think we all expected that Apple would at some point turn on their position. So it's nice to see them uh, appear to start to do that. Um, I have a, a couple points I'll make about that and then a question I want to submit to the panel just uh, about this thing. So uh, I, I see uh, Xbox Live and Apple iOS 8 also doing similar kinds of things where they're listening to their customers, as Megan pointed out, and they're kind of, um, you know, like they, they launch a product, it's got some features that are somewhat restrictive or sandboxed or things like that, and then they respond lately, like in the last year or two, I've seen large companies um, have much more agility in responding to customers' demands to reverse some of these restrictive policies or at least open them up slightly. So iOS 8 is an example, adopting lots of Android-type features, which is really great. 
it's it's taken them long enough, but um, you know they're starting to come around on that stuff. And Xbox Live too. You no longer need an Xbox Gold for subscription on top of all of your peripheral subscriptions like MLB TV, Netflix, uh, so you know Amazon Prime. You need those subscriptions, but you know you go to the store, you buy the device. You should be able to take it home out of box and. If it has apps that support your other subscription services, you should just be able to play them out of box. Now you can, whereas for the previous year, you could not, a previous, actually several years, you could not do that. Uh, you had to also have the $50 a year or $12 a month Xbox Live subscription. So bilking customers is kind of on its way out, which is a good sign. Uh, the question I have is, you know, is the reason that maybe some of these Bitcoin apps haven't reappeared in the U.S. because of this whole jurisdictional positioning um, you know, in a quick scan of the new uh, the new rules that they're going by, it looks like you know it's all going to be on a state by state, nation by nation basis in terms of who gets access. So, is there some? Does anyone know? Has anyone heard anything? Is it like they're not going to allow the U.S. to get uh, their Bitcoin apps back, or what? It, it only seems like the U.K. and Australian app was submitted first. That's really what it feels like. The other the other companies are just probably sub resubmitting their apps. Uh, if we hear that they've been rejected, I, I, I'm sure we'll hear about that. And it does seem like it's a legal issue. So if New York or Ohio, it's possible that Apple could restrict this and we could go to a state-by-state -state Bitcoin app basis, which would be really incredible. So, any, any other thoughts on the uh, Apple restriction issue? Anyone else? Or just move on. Christoph. Um, yeah, so for me... I'm kind of done with Apple on this this topic. Um, as a security professional, I can appreciate some of the benefits of having a walled garden, of having a closed app store where um, the apps are car carefully curated, they're reviewed before they're brought onto the store, because malicious apps can really be quite a pain in the ass for uh, the users of these mobile platforms, and of course, the people that are trying to run the mobile platforms, it makes the it makes the developers and the and the people running the mobile platforms look silly. If um, you know, it's really easy for people to just get their their phones infected and their their address books dumped out, and you know all this other stuff. So I can appreciate the benefit of that, but um, I really feel that Apple has breached my trust with the bans of the, the Bitcoin apps in the past with no, no real legal basis whatsoever. So in terms of uh, me being a customer for Apple um, on their iPhones, I'm, I'm done with them. I'm moving on to Android. Um, and you know, I, wish them, I wish them all the best with that. Yeah, just to echo um, Christoph, I, I'm still an iPhone user. I've been plotting my escape ever since they pulled uh, the Bitcoin apps. This um, has me second-guessing my commitment to leave Apple, but uh, I'm not 100% anymore. Um, it, it's, uh, it's interesting that, you know, with CryptoKit getting pulled from the Chrome, you know, uh, the Chrome extension, you know, they pulled the app just to, I guess it was an accident, but some of these third parties, building apps on third parties or, or allowing third parties to serve access to these apps is really dangerous long-term. You know, you can wake up the next morning and for... An, a mistake, like in the case of Chrome, for example, or even just you know a new law and Apple stops servicing them. So if it can disappear because it's on a you know a walled garden third-party platform like that, that's really dangerous. That's where your money is in some of these apps. In, in the case of some of these apps, so yeah, um, Android's certainly more appealing, and uh, a completely open source would be, of course, better. And I think I'm um, hearing some you know rumblings about open source phones. So. Um, well, that'll be interesting to see. It's really uh, it's cause for optimism, but it's also just having any of these things on, like, with Google or Apple or anything. It's kind of uh, apprehensive, you know. It's Apple is teaching everyone a lesson about walled gardens and where your software comes from and why open source is superior. And Chris, who owns your device? Yeah. Mm. Who owns your device? Yeah. Chris Ellis, your thoughts on the Apple uh, change of mind? Um, I would have in the past I would have agreed with Christoph, but now I just think that Apple want the monopoly on the malware. Like it's just one big malware experience when you use Apple, and I say that as a lifelong Apple user. Um, I am going to be slightly cynical here and say that I think Apple wants a cut of the fees. 
I think they do that already with in-app uh, monetization. I think they can clearly see the way this is going as an industry. You've got a lot of banks. I'm giving a talk at Lloyd's, which is a very large UK uh, bank, in a couple of weeks. I think they kind of see the writing on the wall, and I think that they just want that cut. That's my speculation. If they if they could get a cut, they'd be brilliant. If they built it into the operating system, if they had their own wallet, if they had a way of getting a cut. But right now, it just seems like more like what Will's saying, that consumer demand is there, and the Internet has amplified that, so they hear us, and they change things like the Xbox decision and the Apple decision. And they, they're just they're forced to make this decision they might not want to have wanted to do. Because I think they were trying to protect in-app purchases before, and that this has opened up a weakness in in-app purchases. Yeah. Exit question, and we kind of answered this, but you can just answer again shortly. If the apps are restored, Will you still go Android for your next phone, or is all forgiven? Megan Lords. I am very happy with my Android phone, actually. Uh, my husband has an iPhone, and I hate it. I think it's just not as intuitive as Android, and it doesn't have as many options for apps. And, yeah, there, to me, there's not really a comparison. I've never liked iPhones that much anyway, so I have no interest in them, and I, I won't be switching over anytime soon. Will Pengman. I mentioned I was fully committed to switching, um, and I, I have an opening of doubt here. Mostly it's about just, like, saving a bit of money, right? So if I can get, like, I want to I wanna go with Ting as a service provider for cell service and data service. That'll save me a lot of money, and they don't, uh, I don't think they, uh, or maybe they do support iPhone, I forget. But that, that was my plan for the Android move, and um, it's still, maybe, I think I'm 80-20 um, now. I'm uh, going to go Android 80%, maybe stick with Apple t t um, 20%. Excellent. Christoph? Uh, no, um, I'm ditching the uh, the iPhone boat and heading it over to Android. I will be um, quite relieved if we get to a point where we can get the apps back on the marketplace and I can finally explain to people how to get a damn you know Bitcoin wallet without needing to go to their home and you know mess with their laptop or whatever. Absolutely. The main issue is the, the damage this has done to adoption. It was a lot harder to tell people about Bitcoin when they have a perfectly good iPhone and you can't install a Bitcoin wallet. If they get the Bitcoin apps back, it'll be easier. Chris, your choice. Back to Android, sticking with the Apple. I'm not staying with Apple, no. My next phone will probably be either an open source phone or an Android. Dark times for Apple. Dark times. Moving on. Issue three. Silk Road argues. Or sorry. Study argues that Silk Road reduced violence in the drug trade. Um, FBI, that cryptocurrency trading dark market website that you took down last year, could you put it back up? It was actually doing some good. A new study shows that there was almost no violence involved in the Silk Road drug trade, unlike the incredibly violent real-world one. Should the FBI open a new Silk Road continuing in its mission to reduce violence and protect the American people? Will Pangman. I don't think that's its mission. Does anybody think it's their, that's their mission? Uh, yeah, I mean, right now, you know, Silk Road 1.0 is dead, but Silk Road 2.0 is alive and kicking, and there's at least a dozen other copycats, if you will, that per, that a lot of people are saying are more trustworthy because they have multi-sig and escrow, which the Silk Road 2.0 apparently does not. So, um, yeah, I think that's that side effect is still happening. There's a demand for, um, you know, safe, non-violent means of trade for these kind of system D, gray market, black market goods. And, man, is that wonderful, you know? Uh, no more territory wars, no more threats from large cartels or large uh, gang, um, you know, gangs who have a monopoly over territory. And, um, you know, th there's a lot of accidents that can happen just being in the wrong place at the wrong time when you're in this kind of a market and you're operating in this kind of market. You can be the most peaceful actor, you know, most innocent, a one-time trader even, and get in some proverbial or literal crossfire. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer. And they're still here, and they're only going to get safer, which is good. And, and you know, I think um, it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the black marketplace responds to a much more convenient, much more streamlined, 
um, much lower opportunity cost or, or costs in general from, you know, how much money goes into security and, and like physical security, ammunition, armaments for these cartels and large gangs and things. A lot, right? And, and also enforcement of, you know, keeping your, your minions in check and protection money collection and all this stuff. It's going away and that's amazing. Uh, so, yeah, nonviolent um, interactions, uh, mean for means for trade, and this is consensual adults doing things consensually. No one is uh, harming anyone who isn't uh, consenting to the, um, the instance here. So that's wonderful. I, I agree, Will. It would be incredibly unfortunate if the Silk Road put all of the violent drug dealers and cartels out of business. Christoph, Atlas. So uh, I'm going to be talking about this topic in my presentation at Bitcoin in the Beltway in a couple of weeks, and uh, perhaps some of the thoughts that I provide to you today will give you a sense of the tenor of the presentation that I'll be giving. Um, I don't think that the FBI or the DEA should start uh, restart the Silk Road because if you want to remove violence from the drug trade, it's actually quite simple. What all the individuals at the DEA and the FBI should do is they should all go home and go get a real job and burn their buildings to the ground. You know, Pour the gasoline on there, make sure that there's absolutely nothing left, make sure there's absolutely no possible possibility of salvaging anything that remains of these diseased organizations that exist. Because, of course, the drug trade is so violent because of drug prohibition. So the purpose of these agencies is not to uh, enforce laws, it is not to uh, reduce violence, it's not to go after uh, any kind of real property crime, it is to support these cartels in various forms in a variety of different markets and drug, you know, drug markets are just one of those markets that they support. Um, so some of the other findings that, that were interesting in this report, that or at least that I found interesting, one was that um, a lot of the trade, we, we've been assuming for a while that a lot of the trade was uh, uh, college students uh, who need to smoke weed uh, buying from drug dealers who, um, you know, get it, get it, who, get it from who, who knows where, right? And what they found in the study is that it's, it, the, the prices for a lot of these transactions seem rather high for that. You know, it takes you a while to smoke uh, $1,500 worth of marijuana uh, or at least we hope that it does. You know, it's you're not a very functional user <laughs> if you go through that in uh, a month or whatever. So it seems that a lot of the trade that's happening is actually um, a dealers buying from distributors, and that's why they're suggesting there could be this reduction in drug trade because uh, there may be relatively little. Um, violence between the dealers and the buyers, especially you know, like on a college campus, is one college student who sells marijuana to the other college students going to stab them in their dorm room for for uh, for some cash? No, that's not going to happen. But there is there does seem to be a more plausible uh, story for violence between drug cartels, drug drug distributors, you know, big time players, and the dealers, where there's more cash on the line. And uh, fewer people involved in you know dark at, darker spots, not just on street corners, but in fact in uh, some really um, subterranean kind of meeting places. Uh, of course, none of this was backed up by factual evidence in the report. This was just sort of a speculation on their part. Um, this was perhaps relying building on their experience um, as criminologists and you know law professors, uh, the the people that that co-authored the the study. So more data needs to be obtained in order to uh, to prove this point. But of course, it makes sense that if you would remove, you would take uh, these kind of drug deals from the realm of uh, the streets onto the internet, where you cannot, in fact, reach through and slap anyone uh, through your webcam. Then uh, it would be much more difficult for that to get violent. In a more progressive government, that would be a government program. Chris Ellis. Yeah, it's a bit like when someone starts uh, at your work and they do a much better job than you, showing just how bad a job that you've been doing all this time. I, I've got a theory that the US government is actually embarrassed um, at themselves and uh, are ashamed of being shown up. And so they, I think they arrested uh, Dread Pirate Roberts for that purpose just because he was doing too good a job and they didn't want the voters seeing how someone could take responsibility and uh, be a role model citizen. I'm not saying he was necessarily because we do need more data to, to validate it, but that would be my, my theory. 
It does seem like we have a perfectly good superior administrator locked up in jail right now. Megan Lords. So I was really excited when I first heard about the Silk Road a couple years ago because of this very premise of this article, which is, of course, it reduces violence in the drug trade. I mean, anyone, anyone who's ever had to go through this strange situation of trying to find a plant uh, from other people uh, that happens to be illegal has been and you know has been put themselves in a very dangerous situation when maybe they need it for medicine maybe they need it for you know perfectly legit reasons I think recreational use is legit reasons but you know you could even look at it from a medicinal standpoint these and people on the Silk Road too I mean it wasn't people uh, like Christoph said a lot of people were saying oh well it's just kids buying weed no there were a lot of life-saving drugs that you could buy that people needed access to the regulations were preventing others from getting and as far as the FBI uh, allowing Silk Road to be back or starting their own, I don't trust the FBI to do anything <laughs> uh, competent uh, that's not completely evil. And, you know, it's so hypocritical, the, the government stance on this. They're, they've been fueling this drug war that's killed thousands of people in the course of a very short time. If you look back in history, you know, over time, overall general violence is decreasing, but I'd like to see the numbers for how much the drug war has influenced state aggression on individual people. Our, 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 I'm sorry, our military is literally guarding poppy fields in Afghanistan while busting down, while the DEA is here busting down the doors of people who are using the wrong plant. It's hypocrisy at its finest, and the thing is whether or not the FBI allows there to be a Silk Road or starts their own, there's going to be so many. There already are several black market sites where you can uh, gain access to these uh, materials. So that's just going to keep happening. Anytime you try to make something illegal, you're creating a black market, and in this case, it's a much more peaceful black market than what the drug war has uh, basically agitated in the past uh, couple decades. So I, you know, I, I am all for alternative, and the market is going to provide these alternative ways to peacefully get these substances that people are going to use whether or not people want them to use anyway. So uh, yeah, a lot of hypocrisy here, but I, I think this article showed that it's not really surprising to anyone that, of course, buying drugs online is way more peaceful than having to go uh, buy them on the streets, or God forbid, you get caught with uh, a narc who's <laughs> gonna sting, or you know, in a sting or something, and they end up killing you or something terrible. So uh, yeah, I, I think it just showed what everyone already knew. All right, Will, do you have something to say? Yeah. Um, so the article is about reducing violence in uh, the drug trade or drug war or whatever. You know, it occurs to me that uh, so much of the traffic is international in these marketplaces and you know we have these different laws in different countries you know uh, we have medical tourism in, in America where it's kind of technically legal for people to spend a lot of money make a trip to San Diego and drive to Tijuana and come back with a medication that costs you know one-fifth the amount for cancer treatments or severe things like this um, you know, that they would otherwise, even with full coverage, pre-Obamacare and whatever, would pay five times as much for or more. So um, these markets exist. Medical tourism, there are companies who are like travel agencies for this in particular. So, and that's expensive stuff. So, it, you know, I'm just thinking like borders themselves are really kind of a cause of violence here too. I mean, we have these different rules for different places it, with things that are relatively inert, uh, relatively well tested or understood, but in America you can't have it without a note from a doctor. And in many other well developed first world countries, you can they treat you like a responsible adult, and you can walk into a store and walk out, um, you know, and pay cash, you know. Uh, so again, we, it, it's a it's a bunch of uh, silly rules that these kinds of solutions help to get around. And I think the only the violence that's being avoided isn't only in the interactions with, um, you know, physical physical proximity to s supposed bad actors, but it's also in, in being able to, you know, have access to goods that um, are otherwise like way way cost prohibitive or just with silly rules, you know, where the violence is either from, you know, the 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 regulations or the rules or laws or whatever. The basically the figurative gun being pointed at you from um, Washington, you know, and um, yeah, this is, it's just so much more convenient and affordable 
you know, to buy something that costs, even with insurance, $1,000 for a bottle, you can buy on, you know, Silk Road 2.0 or whatever one of these other ones for like $340, you know? So why wouldn't you do that? I mean, this is just common sense, and uh, it just kind of points out that borders themselves have inherent violence in them, too. Well, my idea is we could start a new marketplace called Sheep Road and then see if all the users get fleeced. Moving I on. Wanted to, uh, I wanted to, I thought of a quote that I wanted to read. This is from uh, New Jack City, um, and there was this drug dealer in the movie played by Wesley Snipes, the famous uh, tax resistor, uh, named Nino Brown in the movie. And he has this quote where he's talking to, I don't know, like a courtroom or something like that, and he says, I'm not guilty. You're the one who's guilty. The lawmakers, the politicians, the Columbia drug lords, all you who lobby against making drugs legal, just like you did with alcohol during the prohibition. You're the one who's guilty. I mean, come on, let's kick the ballistics here. Ain't no Uzis made in Harlem. Not one of us in here owns a poppy field. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is big business. This is the American way. Excellent. Moving on, did you know the Bitcoin Group is broadcast live on the World Crypto Network at worldcryptonetwork.com? And if you were watching us live right now, you could make a prediction or ask a question with the Google Hangouts app, even on your phone. Yes, Virginia, even on your phone. Write your question or prediction now and subscribe to World Crypto Network today. Enough plugs. Moving on. Issue 4. Can Chinese exchange OKCoin OK rescue Mt. Gox creditors? It wouldn't be the Bitcoin group if we didn't talk about Mt. Gox, and this week is no different. Carpellis' Frankenstein monster is back this week with a plan by OKCoin OK to rescue the exchange with the goal of returning 100% of the lost Bitcoins to users by running it for fees, improving on the Mighty Ducks plan to restore 60% of lost Bitcoins. Both plans focus on the ridiculous idea that people would put their money back into Mt. Gox. But other than that, which plan do you favor? The OK Coin plan backed by the exchange? Or the Mighty Ducks plan packed, packed, backed by Bitcoin Foundation member Brock Pierce? Right winger for the Mighty Ducks. Kristoff, Atlas. Okay, to me this does not look like Frankenstein. It looks like someone who has dug up a corpse that has already partially decomposed, that got like the, the little chargers and they're like ch -ch -ch -ch, clear dun, dun, and like there's like there's like smoke coming out of that the, the remaining hair from the, the corpse. Um, I just don't I don't understand this plan. And the, and the longer that it goes on, the more ridiculous it gets. Like they mentioned in the article, they're like, oh well Mount Gox has all this experience at uh, running a stable uh, you know, an exchange, and it's like, when's the last time they ran a, a stable exchange? They're so far behind uh, compared to the other exchanges that are still in business at this point that it's hard for me to understand exactly what uh, expertise they would be exploiting in this situation. So I would just, you know, my sentiment is just let it be, you know, get the, get the creditors, whatever they can get, and let's move on from this. Chris, Ellis. Yeah, we're still being trolled, eh? Like they, they're still having it goes. No, I'm kind of bored of this story now. I think they should just give it up. I totally agree. Megan Lords. I don't like either plan. I would very much like to see the people who lost Bitcoin be made whole again, but I don't think either of these plans is good. I uh, for the same reasons as everyone else, and no one's going to put their money back in Gox, okay? Like, everyone say it with me. No one's going to put their money back in Gox. This is not happening. Uh, they've completely broken everyone's trust, uh, and numerous times, too. Numerous times. Uh, so I, I don't think either one of these ideas are good at all. Will Pangman. Yeah, so I have two little, like, things here, and then a uh, question for the panel too, like, um, why can't any exchange just take up the philanthropy of making the, um, you know, the folks who lost money on Gox whole? Uh, why couldn't they donate a portion or all of their fees for any stretch of time or get together as a consortium and do that? I mean, then resurrecting, you know, this corpse, as, as Christoph so put it. Uh, I don't understand why it's got to be Mt. Gox or those servers or something, unless it has something to do, and this is where my question comes in, with the lost Bitcoins. 
you know. Um, if these coins are lost, anywhere between 200 to 800,000, we've heard some numbers in there, bitcoins, like, just lost. I mean, uh, if they were stolen, they may presumably re-enter the marketplace at some point as, as they're liquidated over time or something. If they're lost they, or destroyed, they're lost or destroyed forever. Uh, if they're, like, seized in, in some of these subpoenas and ongoing, um, you know, court battles either in Japan or in Interpol or whatever's going on, um, yeah, I, 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 does anyone have any thoughts on that? Like, uh, is this a, a plan to actually find the lost coins and reconstitute the people? Or is this a plan to, like, just, you know, through profits, you know, through some business model of some kind, do some philanthropy and give pe make people whole again? Because that could be anybody. That could be Sean's outpost doing that. I, I think you're absolutely right when you say some business model. The business model is a Ponzi scheme. They basically want to re re rebuild Mt. Gox as a Ponzi scheme for the investors who unfortunately lost money last time. The business would run just like a normal business, but instead of taking that profit and returning it to the employees and the investors or reinvesting it in the company, you would give it to your creditors because you're running a Ponzi scheme for the people who lost money in Mt. Gox. That's why it wouldn't work. There's not enough profit to pay them back and to run a business and to profit normally and all the other things a business has to do. Uh, as for the lost bitcoins, the official word uh, from Carpellus is that "quote unquote" transaction malleability led to users withdrawing more than 200,000 bitcoins that uh, the system didn't register properly. Uh, outside experts have said that's not how transaction malleability works. So currently, we have no more data. We're at an impasse there. So we'll Andy had that. a frappuccino latte addiction. Remember? Yeah, and they were under the cat. They were under the cap. Yeah. Well, well, wasn't there um, some analysis in the Willie report that indicated that transaction malleability theft could have only accounted for upwards of 30,000 bitcoins and probably far less? So uh, that was some, some That analysis. could be. There's been, there's been reports of possible hacks where uh, bitcoins were taken from Gox and Gox attempted to keep running, similar to the Ponzi schemes that are being described. And even the desperate actions of the Willie and Marcus bot as the price fell to $300 a coin seem to be attempting to hold on to things. Again, this idea that we could, if we could just make the fees back, if the price would go up or down and we had the right holdings, we could make the fees back, we could cover this, we could get back to zero and back to operating like a business. But yeah. the problem is they're already op operating like a scheme. The whole yeah, so as soon as, as soon as there's a dishonest or a truth withholding type of operation or component to your business model, you have failed. You know, this is, again, why it's so kind of surprising that an anonymous-run business Silk Road 2.0 would go through so much effort to reconstitute um, their customers who had Bitcoin stolen in a hack and faithfully do so all the way up until 100% are reconstituted, which is, a, I'm hearing we're getting close to that. So that's like, it's just appalling, right? That human beings are so terrible, we got to look out for bad actors, you know, pornographers and terrorists and, you know, money launderers and drug dealers and human traffickers and whatever. Um, meanwhile, you know, the people who have everything to gain from lying and not getting caught are doing the exact opposite, you know, and, uh, and, and there's still people, you know, I guess the Carpellis is, uh, I don't know the man personally, but don't mean to disparage him personally, I think he's deserved a lot of derision, but uh, yeah, I mean, th it, if this scam started, as the Willie Report alleges, possibly back in April of 2011, when, uh, somewhere around the first Mt. Gox hack, and then continued through subsequent hacks and and illiquidity problems and whatever else. Wow, I mean, just like another level of thievery and fraud, and it, it, it really just boggles the mind um, that perhaps he might not uh, pay the piper, or the the you know the perpetrators may not pay the piper in this situation. All right, we're moving on to predictions or story of the week. Chris Ellis, do you have a prediction or a story of the week? Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to draw people's attention to something uh, that I find quite interesting. I've been looking at the hash rates recently of Bitcoin. Let me just get uh, my screen share ready. Can you see that? Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. There it is. Um, yeah. So 
one of the things I noticed was that we shot up to a high of like 98 petahashes uh, just before the difficulty adjustment. I've been tracking it because I've been looking at uh, the share prices. This is on a website called Sexio, which is uh, gigahash.io, which is one of the largest um, pools uh, that, that are used for hashing Bitcoin. It currently takes 37% uh, of the network according to blockchain.info. And so I was kind of looking at it because these um, share sites seem to be a bit of a ripoff. You're seeing here that you've got to pay 0 0.00725 uh, Bitcoin in order to get one giga hash, which according to my you know rough calculations in a spreadsheet is never going to get you your money back. And I'm thinking like, so who is buying this stuff? And so I'm kind of keeping my eye on the hash rate and I'm noticing that as the, the weeks go by, I'm noticing that the, the difficulty tends to go up and down quite violently. You see, we go up to 98, and now we're back down to like 85. And it's almost as if that the, the miners are trying to control the hash rate. I don't know for sure. I just really like to get other people's feedback on it. And this is a website uh, by a friend of mine called CryptoCoinStats.com. And it's really cool because it actually shows you the price in red and the difficulty in blue. And you can see here that that this is this is the Bitcoin one, but if you look at like a smaller coin, um, and Feathercoin has a lot of experience with this, but, but in particular Peercoin at the moment, look at how the difficulty goes up and down, up and down, up and down, and these are the so-called strip miners. These are the sometimes the multi pools, and what they'll do is they'll turn on their miners really, really intensively. Often they collude like in IRC channels or in some kind of back channel. They'll mine the hell out of it, and what that means is all the honest sort of long-term miners that, that are trying to support the coin, they just get lots of orphan blocks. So they're just mining for no profit. They're just burning through electricity for, for no uh, coins in return. But then the miners just leave the network. They wait for the difficulty to go down, and then they come back and they attack the network again. There are there are different techniques you can use. You can see this is Feathercoin's one here. We've got quite a granular difficulty adjustment, and we've had to perfect that over time. Um, just with you know lots and lots of iterations, lots and lots of changes to the incentive structures and a lot of community building as well because a lot of this is actually on the forum and in email and actually going to physical meetups um, getting people to, to sort of mine your co coin in you know for, for the long term so I'd be really interested to see if anyone has any kind of insight I mean that looks like a large drop off to me um, that's something like 13 uh, petahashes um, of mining power which you know to me signals something quite potentially quite dangerous really um, that you could have people look at what we had in the hard fork back in March uh, last year uh, where you know the, there was I think it was something like a 20 block fork can en can anyone remember but it, it felt like a long time when it was going on anyway and the only way they were able to salvage the situation was by going on IRC and getting everyone together and everyone rolling back to the old blockchain not even the new one and I believe OK Pay ended up like uh, losing quite a lot of money. So, yeah, does anyone have any uh, thoughts on that? Maybe Christoph, you're quite technical. Sorry, what was the what was the exact question? So, do you think it's possible that someone is playing with the hash rate on Bitcoin? Because everyone talks about how it's like you know the largest network in the world, but everyone forgets you can turn those miners off anytime. And we see this on smaller coins. And is there a possibility that very, very slowly a company, you know, that makes, I'm not going to name any names, so I don't want to bias this conversation, but like uh, they could just be amassing lots of chips, not telling anyone about it, and just mining in the background. Meanwhile, they're taking pre-orders that they're mining on gigahash.io, selling shares at massively impressive prices. Does anyone not see how this could potentially paint quite a dangerous picture? Because we had it firsthand at Feathercoin. We had it all the time. And it was only because we had such a dedicated, loyal bunch of people that just kept plugging away at the incentive structures. And now we're moving over to NeoHash. We actually have a policy now of changing the hash rate um, periodically when this happens to keep mining on it. Because mining should be a zero-sum game shouldn't be a hugely profitable endeavor, and yet with looking at these share prices, it looks like someone is making a lot of money, no? Yeah, um, I guess I have two thoughts on that. One is, if you have a bunch of mining equipment and you want to use that to um, disrupt a market for some kind of profiteering, I probably would go after one of the smaller SHA-256 markets rather than Bitcoin, because it's, it's harder to move in that regard. If you have enough to move the, well, the, the Bitcoin... Well, I showed then. you the, the, the peer coin is that one, no? Peer right, coin right. Shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, why and, I and and I'm certain that that, that that type of manipulation does go in those smaller coins, without a doubt. 
Um, I would quite agree with that, and it's very interesting data that you're pointing out. The other thing that I'm, I'm thinking of, too, is people... Um, there's often this question about, um, you know, in the future, if we didn't have police forces or, or whatever, if we privatize more more stuff, how how would it would work out in the future without there being chaos? And there's this notion of a, a DRO and um, how they would provide these kind of protections to people that sign up with them. And of course, the the first question about any such organization that's going to provide security would be, well, how can I make sure that you're not going to go after me if I'm paying you to buy up guns and stuff like that? And I'm not sure that we necessarily have that kind of critical thinking in place with the mining infrastructure in Bitcoin. I'm curious about that. If people really ask themselves, okay, so we're going to have this company uh, build a lot of mining equipment. We're going to give them a lot of money. They're going to buy the mining equipment. At some point in the future, they promise to send it to us, and we don't really know what they're doing with it in the meantime, right? Mm. Um, and and there's these tremendous delays that happen, supposedly because the equipment is not working yet. But what if it is working, and they're just using the equipment um, in the meantime? I think there's the potential for that kind of scenario, and I'm curious what what the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem is prepared to do to detect such uh, scenarios. Yeah, yeah, you can actually do really, really granular analysis, and there are lots of people out there that do it, but I just think 13 petahashes to suddenly to, to go up that amount and then come back down that amount during a difficulty adjustment. My prediction is that we're going to see a less than 15% increase in the difficulty by next time. I think what they're doing is they're trying to get that best bang for buck on their hardware by turning it off just before the difficulty changes and then ramping it up, you know, you go yeah, ahead, Will. You were going to say something? That, uh, that strategy seems very plausible. Um, maybe to play devil's advocate for a minute, you know, there's a lot of institutional money coming into mining, hardware manufacture, and uh, data centers, too, and just like the funding and operation oh, of large farms. So if there's, um, you know, large farms upgrading, updating, or coming online for the first time, um, or, you know, maybe moving, relocating, uh, I, maybe we could see some of this thing. I, you know, I think maybe this time last year there was probably we saw the news uh, piece. Um, I think it was a like uh, Seattle or something. There's this huge mining farm outside of Seattle. It was like you know they showed us the one in Hong Kong last summer. They showed us that one earlier in the winter time here. And then I'm reading now of like more and more popping up all over the place. So if it, uh, you know it's accelerating that that industry. Maybe that's uh, part of it. I think there's some shenanigans, like you're pointing out, with the difficulty readjustment, timing that appropriately so that you can, you know, try to manipulate the difficulty readjustment from going too much higher. Um, and, you know, on the other side of the coin, the more nefarious side, I guess, um, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. I, I, I am hearing of people trying to rent supercomputers and things, or steer botnets, you know, people who are newly coming aware of Bitcoin, having high technical capability and access to resources that maybe they don't cost them very much, they just can, they, they have, you know, have their hands on it, they're in touch with it, and they're directing these networks um, to mine Bitcoins, uh, you know, and, and we don't find out about this until well after the fact of the, the operation stopping, so maybe there's, um, maybe there's some of that stuff going on too, where just more and more people are coming to realize this is legit, and uh, that they can get away with maybe some kind of manipulation early on and walk away scot-free kind of thing. So that's, that's what I would suspect. And I think lots and, lots and lots of data centers are coming online or upgrading. Um, to Christoph's point about delaying shipping of hardware, uh, of course we know a couple na names of companies who have um, you know, been doing that. There are several also who ship very quickly, uh, and at least from what you're looking at, in terms of how quickly they can get the, um, the materials to build the hardware and then ship it, it doesn't look like they're sitting on the machines for very long at all, if at, if at all, because uh, they're shipping them so quickly, some companies are. So, um, and then other, other companies are changing their business model from manufacture instead of shipping and, and, um, and that kind of thing, they're just selling the cloud mining shares. So they're building machines and then just allowing uh, co cloud, con cloud mining contracts and not really shipping hardware out. So um, maybe some of the adjustments of these large companies' business models is affecting it. 
And I just wanted to make a quick comment too. My technical understanding is probably far below much of the other people on this panel, but I think as far as an understanding of human nature, you have to factor in that there's a lot of incentive to cheat the system and uh, manipulate things. And I think as we, as Will said, as we get more people coming into Bitcoin who have a very good technical understanding and who have a lot of money and power, I think you are going to see um, that threat become more possible. And I think, I mean, I think it could even be starting, you know, on a smaller scale right now. So I'm really glad Chris pointed it out because I think this is something we should really be looking at and following. And uh, I really hope that there can be some kind of creative uh, solution to it. But uh, but I think it's something that we should be keeping a really close eye on because, I mean, you know, I, I think most people are generally good, uh, you know, not super good good people but you know people are motivated by their self-interest so you have to watch that even even though Bitcoin is small now as it kind of grows that's going to become more of an issue it's only going to get worse um, as far as being a, a serious problem so I'm, I'm glad Chris pointed out and it's something that I need to learn more about first of all so I can have a better understanding of it but I think we all should be keeping an eye on it yeah. And I think it's a key, it's a key uh, point that why we do need these alternative cryptocurrencies because they're doing a lot of the hard work. And uh, Gavin Andreessen mentioned at the conference that you don't really know how to secure something valuable until that valuable asset is on the line, right? So we're never going to be able to secure uh, the code within Bitcoin unless there is something at stake. And this is a high stakes game. So I think a lot of these smaller alt currencies are kind of learning about that. And I think what's becoming evident is that you can't just have an army full of mercenaries, right? If everyone that's mining on the blockchain is only doing it for profit, no, no, no mercenary is going to put themselves into harm's way in battle, right? You're going to want a, a breakup of patriots and mercenaries in your army. So I think we're going to have to, people are going to have to mine these coins just because, you know, out of, out of some sort of sense of duty until the mining just who comes absorbed into the atmosphere and it's just space heaters and light bulbs and that kind of thing. Some of the mining problem might come from these companies that are setting themselves up based upon the future value of Bitcoin. They're not mining to break even today, they're mining based upon this idea if they get a bunch of Bitcoin, they hold them for a couple of years, they could sell them for a lot more. So they're not necessarily dialed in businesses in the normal way of profits. They're more obsessed about getting these miners. As for the um, the supercomputers, uh, a guy did try that. He was a scientist with access to government computers, and it's really unfortunate because supercomputers don't mine Bitcoin very well, is what we learned. He only made about $8,000, and he's now been banned from using government computers, which was his old career. So for $8,000, he's given up, I presume, a doctorate, at least uh, several graduate degrees. Uh, it's a very bad trade-off, but it's probably just Bitcoin got in his head, drove him mad, like Will was talking about with the botnets, with the technology. When you find out Bitcoin and you're technologically superior, maybe you go out there and try to get some for cheap. Uh, and it just your eyes get bigger than your stomach. And uh, as for the other issue of pre-orders, if we could only agree that if we're going to pre-order something from a company, we kind of need to be monitoring that company now. We need cameras. There's no reason that if you're a Bitcoin mining company selling hardware, and that's what you really want to do, you should have cameras in your entire factory. You have big signs on them. We're broadcasting on the internet all the time. Tell all your employees nobody should be up to any funny business because we're going to be on the internet all the time. And this way we'll know for sure that you're not testing on those miners longer than you're supposed to be. And if you're cloud mining for someone that you do have cloud mining rigs and that you're selling access to it, a data server farm. There should just be cameras. It should just be broadcast. Megan Lords, do you have a prediction? Moving back to the show. <laughs> well, I don't have a prediction, but I'm still in the midst of shilling for Bitcoin in the Beltway. So, uh... then your microphone froze. Hey. No, can you hear You're me? Back. You're back. Bye. All right. All right. So, if you're on the West Coast, uh, this might this might be good for you. You can still get hotels at the rate. Um, until the end of the day, this is the last day to lock in uh, the Bitcoin in the Beltway rate for the uh, hotel, the, the Renaissance Hotel in downtown DC for the conference. So if you're still planning on going, it's going to be a really, really awesome 
radical conference and I just got a preview of some of the shirts that Dobby is going to have there and they're very cool looking. Uh, there's going to be a rebel shirt that we're selling and we're also going to be selling kill the precedent shirts in DC at Bitcoin in the Beltway. So please come by and check it out. And that's June 20th and 21st? Uh, June 20th through 22nd. Just, so a, three just days. two weeks away. Yep. Very good. Will Pangman. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I would shill for Tatiana again, uh, but I did a good job of that last week, I think. So this week, I'm going to shill for one of my favorite new Bitcoin startups, um, Bitcoin apps. It's called QuickCoin, quickcoin.co. This allows you to send and receive Bitcoins via Facebook. It's very, uh, it's relatively secure. Um, I, I've talked with the developers, and they've, they've worked with me on some bugs that um, I was able to identify and, and things like that. Minor things, but uh, it's, it's awesome. And again, if we're talking about ways of introducing people to Bitcoin, we need Bitcoin wallet apps on iOS, and we need to be able to send and receive Bitcoin via social media channels, especially Facebook, where the most users reside. And um, this is a great way to introduce people and show them, oh, it's easy, oh, and it's cool, and, you know, fun. Um, you can tip people that way or just surprise them. You know, I gave someone a birthday present yesterday. Um, today I, I told someone who, who taught me something that I was going to pay them, and I did, and they were like, whoa, and this is, these are non-Bitcoin-centric people whatsoever. So, um, you know, they just have to follow some simple instructions, link their uh, Facebook account to the QuickCoin wallet, and um, yeah, it's, it's super easy and fun to send people money that way. I highly encourage that if you are interested in spreading adoption or any kind of Bitcoin activism or outreach whatsoever, that you put this in your arsenal, quickcoin.co, um, support them. There's actually a lot of really cool uh, services that they're going to be coming out with. And um, I don't want to take any words out of the mouth of anyone I've talked to. I'll just speak for myself. I think um, some of these things, I don't even know what they are, but I do know that uh, the big boys in the industry will have to be taking notice to QuickCoin, and that includes Circle, Coinbase, and the like. So keep an eye on QuickCoin, and for now, enjoy tipping people on Facebook. Christoph, Atlas. Yeah, I think that um, the Mt. Gox uh, stuff will be settled soon, and uh, what they're going to do is they're going to give all, the, it's going to take all the money, divvy, divvy it up, and uh, give it back to the investors. And they'll take one Bitcoin and put that towards a, a Mark Capelli's uh, dunk tank, where all of the uh, the people that had an account with Mt. Gox will be able to come to the dunk tank and uh, give him the plunge. That would be good for the for the end of days. He should be there until the end of time in the dunk tank. Prediction: All the dominoes are starting to fall. Bitcoin is surrounded by friends with new businesses joining up every day. Larger and larger corporations are realizing that it wouldn't take too much money to set up Bitcoin, and once it is set up, they could pay less in fees and offer a better payment option to their customers. The internet of money is forming right before our eyes, and the future is so bright. I'm wearing shades. We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>